Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Faith and Friends. A few months ago, we surveyed several of you, our viewers, and asked what you consider to be the issues that plague our community. More than 80% of you responded by telling us that heroin, drugs, and situations surrounding that were the number one problem in our community. Statistics show that we are seeing terrible skyrocketing rates when it comes to overdoses and other things. But what is the solution? Is there a solution? And how can we as Christians be involved? We'll sit back for the next 30 minutes. We're gonna dive into this subject with a woman who knows it very well. Executive Director of the Drug Free Action Alliance, Marcy Seidel, joins us today on Faith and Friends. Thank you so much for being with oh, us. Thank you for having me. I'm so thrilled to be here. Well, before we get started talking about the opiate crisis. Mm -hmm. Let's first just talk about the Drug Free Action Alliance. Who is, who are you guys and what do you do? Well, Drug Free Action Alliance is a statewide uh, nonprofit. We're a certified prevention organization. We've been around for 30 years. Uh, actually, we celebrate next year our 30th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And our, our mission is leading the way to promote healthy lives through the prevention of substance abuse and related problems. So we're very focused on being on the front end of this uh, this drug epidemic and, and of drug use and trying to get people and young people to not even start down this path. So we've, we have lots of programs that we do throughout the state of Ohio. We work with networks of family groups, colleges, youth-led groups, coalitions, you name it, we work with communities uh, in this effort. And you recently had an, or, an event at Cedarville University, so you work with faith Christian-based organizations too. We, di we do. We usually work with the faith based on co community coalitions, and they're kind of a part of it. But we really wanted to pull out very special, the faith base, because we think they're the key to this entire problem. And they have the assets, the resource, and the love and the compassion to do what needs to be done in it. So we had this uh, faith-based organization conference it was tremendous. We had about 150 people that joined us. We had Sheila Ray Charles came in, who is the daughter of the late and great Ray Charles. She uh, evangelized, she sang, she mm -hmm. poured out her heart in a testimony of how her life has changed as she came to know God and kicked a 23-year addiction to crack cocaine. Wow. It was marvelous and it was fun to be able to to show our faith and praise the Lord and to attack this problem on the level of Christianity. Wow so if you'd like to find out more about this organization you can go to their website www.drugfreeactionalliance.org of course you can um, also contact them by phone or by address but let's go ahead and get started talking about Ohio's opiate crisis. I've heard the word crisis many times as parents, grandparents, people are realizing what is, ta you know, what is rapidly taking place mm -hmm. um, to our young people, not just young people, but to people in general. Tell me what you see when it comes to this opiate ep epidemic here in the state of Ohio. Well, it's one of those epidemics that sort of sneaked in on us. And I think the sort of the, the, it's a perfect storm. So many things happened that got it to the point where it is. We have, first of all, sort of this relaxed atmosphere around the fact that drugs, it's, well, what are the big deal? The drugs, recovery works, and so people are kind of lax about that. And the other thing that has uh, contributed to this is that there was um, the, the opiate painkiller things have taken quite a hold in Ohio, well, all, actually throughout the entire nation. And one of the reasons for that is, is that they made this, the, that pain became the fifth vital sign. And mm. physicians were judged on how well they do by how well they control the pain of a patient. And when you do that, we found that well-meaning physicians were giving lots of opiate painkillers to address problems of all sorts, from a tooth extraction right down to just about any other sort of pain that might manifest itself. So when that happened, that increased the, um, the prescription drug abuse. And then from the prescription drug abuse, we moved into the heroin epidemic. And so it's kind of this ongoing thing where this happened, that happened, and then the, the forces came together and it exploded. So this is a, an epidemic that's not just in the shadows anymore. It's now moving into uh, all rural counties and uh, suburban counties and urban counties. Just name the location in Ohio, name the social economic class, mm -hmm. and it has touched those lives immensely. Oh, yes. And you know, <laughs> for so many years, what we heard was crack cocaine. Right. And we heard about marijuana. But then it just seemed like heroin 
became that secret word mm -hmm. that was hitting the farm areas and hitting the, the wealthy areas and, and it just was hitting everywhere and now, now here we are. Right, and one of the things, again, was that we, we opened up the, drug, the prescription drug abuse as, as kind of the opening door to that. For example, people who would have a tooth extraction, you might need a, a serious pain reliever for maybe two days, maybe three days, but where we were finding, uh, again, well-meaning pharmacists uh, and um, physicians uh, prescribing 30-day supply, 60-day mm. supply, 90-day supply. So there's all of these drugs floating out there that were being unused, and certainly where people could abuse them, they found a way to do that. Then on the other hand, we had a very uh, unique uh, drug cartel, or it's, mm. it's not even a cartel, I think. It was just a small town in Mexico where they were uh, steeped in poverty and they were trying to find a way to make a better life for themselves. And they were at the foothills of the mountains that grew the uh, opiates or the poppies. Mm. And they found a way to do a tremendous business plan to go in and make black tar heroin and bring it in here. So when the pill mills got closed down, when the pills, prescription pills got too hard to find and too expensive, they could bring in very inexpensive mm. heroin which molecular structure is almost identical to uh, an opiate pain uh, medicine. And they brought that in at a very low cost and, uh, and a very slick marketing plan and got lots mm. of people then hooked on heroin. Goodness, it just, it frustrates me. I just see the hands of Satan <laughs> taking over. You, you take something that was intended to be used <clears throat> to help people through their surgery recovery or things, and now it's destroying lives. It's, it's taking over. Well, absolutely. I mean, absolutely it is. Like I said, it was the perfect storm. And I, and I really do believe that as Christians, we need to come out and take a look at this because we are in a war in this world. And I think Satan has found a way to take something good and to make it evil. And he's done, he's, he's in overtime on this yeah. one. So it takes all of us, every one of us. And, and we're working on it so hard through the state level and the federal level, and certainly in communities. But I think that piece that's really missing and that is crucial is to bring the faith based in because I truly believe that all the good work we're doing will only be good work until we bring God into it and have him help us to get this done. So I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, promoting that and saying that, and I'm delighted to have that opportunity to talk about it today. Because God, Jesus, that is our answer. It is our answer. That's right, when all else seems impossible, when everything else seems lost, the strength of Jesus still stands strong. And miraculous things can take place, even for a person who's been addicted, like you said, 23 years addiction, and uh, she has that testimony to come clean what God has done in her life. It was a tremendous testimony that she gave. She, as I said, 23 years, uh, a lot of trauma and hurt and pain in her life. And we know that's one of the things that starts addiction is people try to self-medicate. But she talked about her third stint in federal prison and she had lost all five of her children to foster care. And she said she laid on the floor that night and was not uh, connected to God in any way, but reached out to God and said, if you are great and good, please help me. What can you do? And the thing that was that I took away from her testimony that I thought was so powerful, that she said, the ceiling started to talk to me. And, and it said, I will take all your pain. I will take all your hurt. I will take that away from you. Now I want you to go out and glorify me. And what she said was, is that when she went out and, and renewed her, her, her coming to Christ in that. She said it was the people that came to prison with the word that fed her. And she said, you all need to go to the prison or to wherever the need is and feed the word to people. And that's how I am, where I am today, I am strong. God opened the door, but you are the ones that are feeding me through his hands. That was so powerful to me. And I know everybody else in the room, it was powerful as well. So here we are in an epidemic, which could appear to be hopeless. Mm -hmm. It could be, appear that once a person is strung out in this way, is addicted, <clears throat> that their end is gonna be demise. But yet I listen to you say that the hope in Jesus is still strong. And so if we have viewers at home that are saying, you know, my child is affected by this. My grandchild is affected by this. My neighbor's child is affected by this. My neighbor, they shouldn't give up hope. 
No, they shouldn't give up hope. And there, there, are, there are a lot of resources out there that we want to encourage them to look for. I mean, we, we talk about what's called the continuum of care. So uh, in the church and in the family, there's a lot of things you, you can do. The first part of the continuum of care is prevention, just trying to keep people from ever getting hooked and snared into this, mm -hmm. this evilness. And then the other one is, is to look at for the signs and the symptoms where something's not going exactly right. And you can do an intervention to see if you can stop it. Then the third tier of it is to get people into solid recovery and to make sure that they get what they need, not only in a physical sense, but an emotional and spiritual sense. And then once they have gone through the recovery process, the next stage of that is, is aftercare, because this is not a go in, get mm -hmm. fixed and done and out. This is one of the things, and especially where I feel the church is very needed, is you wrap your love and support around those individuals and carry them every day, one step at a time, in their aftercare from recovery to make sure that they don't relapse and that they feel that love and that connection that Jesus and that they can give to them. Well, one thing I hear over and over, you know, once many of these individuals end up in jail, not all of them, but they do, when they get out, they've got to have that new network. They've got to, and even if they haven't been in jail, they've got to get the new network. They can't be surrounded by the same people. So that's where I see the church is such an important potential to provide that. Absolutely. I think it is too. They always say you cannot go back to the same environment. You have to go back to a new environment. And that's where the church can come in because a lot of time when people come out of incarceration, there are several things happening. They need to be very supported in their recovery if they've gone uh, completely through it. They also need a job, they need food, they need uh, guidance, they need social services, and the church in its environment can pull all these things together and help counsel and support and love somebody and show them the direction that they can go, where they can get support and help, and certainly the church is one place where they can get a lot of that to start with, but there's a lot of social services out there that can provide it. They just need someone to come walk along beside them and help them in this journey, because it's not an easy journey. Mm -hmm. But when you have Christ standing with you and someone who is dedicated to help you, no matter what your past sins have been, no matter what your life has been, when you can come together and say, we're gonna do this together, what a powerful difference that can make. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are talking with Marcy Seidel, Executive Director of the Drug Free Action Alliance. And don't go away. When we come back, we're going to continue our talk about things like fentanyl and carfentanyl, this as a disease and an epidemic, and the importance of prevention. We'll be right back with the special Faith and Friends show, The Opiate Crisis, Awareness, Action, and Prayer. Click, call, visit, or automatic giving. It's safe and convenient to be a financial partner with TV44. Call today to learn about monthly giving through your financial institution or with a credit card. Or donate online, by mail, or in person. Thanks for your financial support. Welcome back to our conversation with Marcy Seidel, Executive Director of the Drug Free Action Alliance. Learn more about the Drug Free Action Alliance by visiting www drugfreeactionalliance.org. You can also contact them by email, contact at drugfreealliance.org. There you see their address on the screen as well as the phone number. Marcy, let's talk about uh, two words that might be somewhat familiar to people around us, but definitely are familiar in the drug culture and in this fight against it. Fentanyl and carfentanyl. Oh, those um, is kind of the evolution of this disease of what's happening. <clears throat> Excuse me. What's happening is that fentanyl, which is a synthetic drug, is 50 times more uh, powerful than heroin. Mm -hmm. And so drug dealers are putting that, cutting that into heroin to make it the better uh, product for their people. That means there's a bigger high, uh, it's, it's more powerful. So the people that are very um, addicted or um, dependent upon this substance, they start to build up a resistance or a tolerance to it. So they need more powerful things. So fentanyl and carfentanyl allows this to happen. So uh, fentanyl is 50% more high uh, toxicity than, than uh, um, heroin. heroin. And car carfentanyl is uh, 100 times more wow. than fentanyl. So that's even that much more than heroin. 
It's a very dangerous drug. And as I said, they're cutting that in to make a better product. That's what we're finding now that's increasing so many of the deaths that are happening and overdose deaths that are happening around the state is when those uh, substances have been cut into it. And certainly the carfentanil is just making its its um, appearance on the scene uh, in, in the drug world, but that is a dangerous drug. drug. Um, a, a kilo, which is 2.2 pounds, has uh, enough um, dangerous substances in it that it can kill over, it can kill millions of people hmm. just out of a kilo. You can get it on your skin, you can inhale it, and certainly uh, you can put it into in injecting it Whatever it is, it's a deadly substance. And even law enforcement now are concerned about that as they confiscate drugs as to if it even touches their skin, wow. they have a problem to worry about. This is a dangerous drug that is coming to us from overseas, from China, and we have to be very, very concerned about it. Fentanyl as well, very concerned about this because this is what's causing so many of our overdose deaths. And we know overdose deaths right now uh, have overtaken car crashes. There are more of them taking place today than even car crashes. Eight people a day die from an overdose death uh, in Ohio. That's mm -hmm. just in Ohio, and, and the numbers keep climbing. So we have to be concerned about these drugs. We have to figure out how we cut off the supply. We have to be concerned about how we educate the public about them so that they're aware of them. This is a big problem, and again, we have to turn God's help on this one. This is a big problem. Now, individuals who mm. are looking at this from the outside and recognize, okay, so my loved one has been addicted, my loved one wants to get clean, but keeps having relapses and falling back, you know, why can't they just get clean? Why yeah. can't they just break this addiction? That, there's, that's a, kind of the thought that most people have about people who uh, have a substance use disorder, disorder, is that it's a decision. And when a decision, when a substance abuse uh, disorder starts, uh, it goes in and the drug changes the chemistry of the brain. And when it changes the chemistry of the brain, it becomes something that an individual needs just as much as an individual needs food and water. And in many cases, they need it more than food and water. So it's not that they want to do it. It's not that uh, it's a decision. The drug has made the decision for them. So um, while they are, are caught up in this disease, they start to do things and say things and become things that is certainly not who they are. It's what the drug is doing. They're doing it now just to maintain a normal level in life. No longer are they getting high when they get to this point. They're just trying to get up from the depths and the despair of how this drug makes you feel when you come off of it. And they're trying to get back to where they can feel normal and they can feel like they're functioning again. It is a devious, devious disorder, a devious drug that takes over life. And again, I think it's a very evil, kind of the evil thing that has taken over our communities. When you look at our communities, we're starting to become really a drug culture and we'll find people say, well, they should just do marijuana because marijuana is not as, as harmful as this. But a drug is a drug and all drugs that are coming in are taking the place of God who can fill mm -hmm. that hole in people's lives, and that's what we need to do. So we need to get those people not only to get perhaps medically assisted treatment, we need to get them uh, the ability to, to work with counselors that can help them change their thinking and, and to work on those problems that may have led them to the use of these drugs to start with. And then I think the third factor is we need to bring God and the faith base mm -hmm. into that to surround and support and to love and to lift. Because in my personal life, I've seen miracle after miracle mm -hmm. and I trust in God to help to do that along with all these other resources that he provides us. So how could parents or grandparents mm -hmm. or individuals who care, how can they best be a support? It can be frustrating. I've heard that a heroin mm -hmm. um, withdrawal can take weeks and it can be weeks of laying on the floor shaking and the body just not responding as it goes through this. And that can be really difficult for a parent to know what to do or how to support. It really is difficult. And in some cases, there is a point where you just have to sometimes let, let go and let God. And the fact is that too many parents have enabled their children. And when I say children, it can be anywhere from a, a teenager up to a 30-something year old. That's when we're finding that probably 18 to 35 is probably the big age range 
that people get really hooked and involved in this. And sometimes they do have to let go, and they have to uh, not enable the disease anymore and to let that individual start to face the consequences. And when they start getting to the lowest of the low, uh, just as Sheila Ray Charles did in that prison when they got to the lowest of the low or to a certain spot, they are willing and able to hear a, a voice from God that they've never heard before. So that's when I think you turn to prayer and you let go and you pray a lot because it might not be a good outcome, but it might not be a good outcome either as you find uh, your loved one could be taking your resources, they could be selling things from you, they could be stealing from you. They're certainly taking away your calm and your dignity as you're trying to support them and you're living in this incredible um, sweep of difficult things that happen uh, because yeah. of the disease and the addiction. And so I, I, I think everybody uh, needs to, to go seek counseling and help when that happens and to, to be on the path of how they can best help. And I think, again, the faith base wrapped around them is one of the best things you can do. Well, prayer, I feel prayer is the, is the most powerful weapon that we have. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's difficult to be patient and sit back and trust God that he is working and doing things because it's never on our timeline. We want Absolutely. it fixed now, Absolutely. But yet we need to trust that. So prevention wise, of course, we, we are dealing now with addicted individuals who need support and prayer and guidance and assistance, but how about the efforts to make sure that we stop this trend from continuing? And again, I think the church and the faith-based community is very well poised for this. First of all, we need to, um, we need to support our youngest, our youngest of the young and giving them um, the, the protective factors and, and try to eliminate the risk factors in their lives so they, they are protected and they grow up and they have a, a solid social emotional learning and they're they are self-regulating and they can make good decisions even at the, at the youngest level. And then bring them up with the expectation. So we need to set expectations for our children. And the expectation is that you don't do drugs. You don't do any drugs. You do not drink alcohol uh, until perhaps you're uh, of legal age. And so um, we need to surround them with those messages of, of who they are and, and come alongside them and give them those personal relationships that are so important. And then also um, perhaps the, the, the messages of of prevention of, of what the consequences are as they get older, age appropriate messages along the way. But the church also provides activities and group activities that channel our children into really positive directions. And we encourage the church to find a place for their young people in their communities to do things that, that can help and promote the wellness of all people and volunteer and to be uh, very uh, active in the church life. That's one of the things that they can do. We have also uh, resources that are available. Uh, we have something that's called Start Talking, which is a governor's initiative and embedded in that program, oh, well, in that initiative to help people understand uh, what they can do in their communities is a program called No. K-N-O-W explanation point. And we've had that program in place for many years and we have uh, partnered with the governor's office to promote that. What it does is to uh, give emails to those who sign up for it to receive t uh, emails twice a month that allows them to understand uh, the parent to understand what are those factors in a child's life that are the risk factors that you need mm -hmm. to look out for. What are the trending drugs? What are those things that you need to be aware of that could be pitfalls in your child's life. And then we give them opportunities. How do you talk about that with your children? Mm -hmm. How do you approach your children? What are the things you can do to help your children? And give them the kind of a tutorial to do that. This is based on research that if uh, parents and grandparents and, and important people in young people's lives talk to them often about drugs and alcohol, and, and the consequences and what's important in their lives, they are 50% less likely to ever even start using drugs. That's a powerful thing that you can do. Just walking alongside a child, talking to them, embracing them, and encouraging them. So we have that. We have uh, Cardinal Health has uh, Generation RX, which is giving you information specific to prescription drug uh, use and what uh, each segment of uh, society, whether it's from young people on up through seniors, right across the lifespan, what you can do to promote good prevention um, 
uh, uh, tentacles in that. So there's, there's a lot of programs out there, but there's a lot of things that the church can be doing too. To look at, you want to, uh, to keep that young person in a positive place, mm -hmm. doing positive things, and there's a lot of help out there to get them to do that. If our viewers are interested in finding more about that no initiative and the resources that are there, can they go to your website? To Absolutely, find that? they can find all of that on our website and um, or they can contact us and call us and we'll make sure they get connected. All right, there you can see some contact information available for the Drug Free Action Alliance. So if you are on Facebook or Twitter, those are two ways that you can connect with this organization and their website there, drugfreeactionalliance.org is where, as Marcy said, you can find out more information about that initiative, um, other uh, details about the things that the Alliance are doing and uh, contact information so you can contact them directly. There you see the address on the screen, 6155 Hurley Road, Suite H in Columbus, and the phone number is 614-540-9985. The email address is contact at drugfreeactionalliance.com. Dot o -R -G. As we're getting ready to close, Marcy, um, we have a lot of people who pray. You know, we've got a lot of viewers who are <laughs> strong in prayer. How, can, how would you suggest they can best be praying for what you are doing as well as this entire epidemic as a whole? Yeah. Um, I think, first of all, we pray that God come along and have mercy on us, uh, truly all of us. I would ask that they pray for those that are on the front lines uh, in our schools, um, in our youth uh, group areas that work with young children just to pray that they get, get solid messages uh, and that, that they can provide for the young people that they're uh, working with and to, to give them what they need to help keep them in, in a, a good place in their lives. We pray then also that those that, that are needing help can be recognized very early that we can get them help before it becomes such so far down the road that is just a, a total crisis and they might even overdose and lose their lives so that we can find those people and do those interventions. And then we pray for those that are in recovery, please to help them to find the peace and love of God and, and the resources that need to help them as they walk through that. And finally, we ask that they pray for those that have come out of recovery, that you surround them in your love and that you help them to take one step every day in the right direction, in the path of the Lord, so that they stay uh, in a place that they are free of all those substances and they are contributing, loving members of God's community. All right, Marcy Seidel, Executive Director of the Drug Free Action Alliance, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, this encouragement, great information. That we can uh, work together with Absolutely. Jesus to try and fight this epidemic. Don't forget, you can watch this interview again, and you can share it with your friends by going to our website, faithandfriends.wtlw.com. Again, the website for the Drug Free Action Alliance is www.drugfreeactionalliance.org. Thanks for joining us today on Faith and Friends. We'll see you next week.